Welcome to the Ian Bounsfield Experience. I'm glad you're here. This series of podcasts are just things that come up in my mind when I'm thinking about playing, when I'm thinking about teaching, and general thoughts about music. There are some things here that I hope you'll find really useful. And don't forget, if you've got any comments or if there's anything you want to discuss further, go to ianbowsfield.com. A Tale of Two Beaches and that short clip should give you a clue as to which the second beach is. We'll come to that later. Now, before I start the podcast, um, I was looking at my analytics recently and I realized that because I haven't made that many podcasts, the sort of like listenership has uh, dropped somewhat. Um, really not that many people listen in September. My own fault, really. But anyway, listen, I've got a favor to ask. If you enjoy this, if you enjoy these podcasts and you think other people would enjoy it, let people know about it. Maybe share it on Facebook. Tell your friends about it. Um, I don't do this to make any money. There's no sponsorship of it. I do it for fun. But it'd be nice to think I come down here into my basement and speak to quite a few people. It's quite a strange feeling, but there you go. Um, I was recently in uh, Miami at the New World Symphony, at the wonderful New World Symphony, and yet again, people were coming to me and thanking me for helping them through these difficult times. Let's hope we can leave all of that behind us and I can help you through the good times as well. <laughs> I remember walking down Lincoln Road in Miami and I can't remember whether it was 1988, August of 1988 or 89 with Michael Tilson Thomas. And he said, this is where we're going to build it. This is where we're going to do it. It was, you know, orchestras, America's Orchestral Academy. And uh, that was right before it had even started. And in a building which is now the H&M on Lincoln Road, used to be the Lincoln Theatre. And for many years, um, that's where the New World Symphony rehearsed and played concerts. I have so many happy memories over, over 30 years of going to Miami to work with those wonderful young people and that incredible family that runs it. Um, uh, they now perform in this state-of-the-art, incredible Frank Geary-designed um, New World Center, just behind um, where um, the um, Lincoln Theater was. And um, at the time, like I say, 98, 88, 89, I can't remember, my, the, the place was completely run down. The redevelopment, regeneration, uh, of, of Lincoln Road is quite incredible and Miami has become this huge thriving you know hub um, so anyway it was great to go back there it was great to feel almost normal I've had some difficulties with getting visas for the US recently and actually um, well not recently over the last 10 years it's been getting increasingly difficult to get over to do anything and the bureaucracy and paperwork this time was completely out of sight it was far more involved than it has ever been however however um i was i slipped through immigration because all of the papers were there simply everything was there you need this you need this you need this it worked anyway back to miami took my traditional walk down the beach on my first morning big long walk it was wonderful wonderful really fantastic anyway you know, the young people in New World Symphony have changed so many times over the years. Their outlook, their appearance has changed. But at the heart of things, their aspirations and who they are as people, these wonderful people, hasn't changed at all. So it was a great, great pleasure, a great honour. Many of the people on the platform had not actually played for an audience for 18 months um, so it was it was a you know it was a tough challenge for all of us the program was amazing um, Jonathan Bailey Holland uh, Melody Edvosh uh, Rainer Eschmel 
Stravinsky, Octet, Chelsea, I Presagi, and then finishing off with um, Gustav Holst, Perfect Fool. Um, I must say something about two of the pieces, the Melody Etwasch. Melody Etwasch is a, an Australian composer, and Rainer Eschmel is an American composer. They were, are wonderful pieces, both very different. Wonderful composers, quite different in their style, but two composers really worth looking out for, really worth checking out. Um, I would be delighted if either of them were to <clears throat> consider writing a trombone piece for me. Um, <laughs> they were fantastic. I might be cheeky and write to them. Um, and the uh, Chelsea, I Presagi, if you haven't listened to that, if you don't know that, it's for ten brass and uh, percussion and saxophone. So Chelsea did have a sense of humour after all. <laughs> and it's, we've recorded it and it's going to be going up live to air, I think at some point in November from the New World. The concert was recorded. Take a listen to it when it comes out. It is its own unique musical language. You know, it's very, very Eastern philosophy, Buddhist inspired. And in number three, when it all comes together, when everyone's landing on those, that A natural, I think it's an A natural, yeah, I shouldn't have studied the school. When it all landing on there, I have never stood in the middle of an ensemble and experienced anything like that ever in the whole of my musical life. It is incredible. At the heart of it, it's kind of like a stream of consciousness melody. It's very, very melodic. Um, it's difficult to get to know. It can be a little bit difficult to listen to because it's its own unique musical language. It's original, that is for sure. Um, but I think we've laid down a pretty definitive recording of it we worked on it incredibly hard and we got some wonderful coaching from michael tilson thomas uh, in fact i got five hours straight coaching from michael tilson thomas he's been my guiding light musically for 35 years and i was a fan of his before that um, and uh, you may know he's gone through tough times health wise at the moment but um, he still broke me <laughs> in five hours at distance um, and uh, all I was fit for was to going to bed after that. Now you may remember from other podcasts I said I came down um, to to the cell to get peace and quiet and I've just noticed that our cat is sleeping in a corner again and he's now bored of my podcast and actually would like to get out of the room so I'm just going to stop this hang on here we go and I'll start again. And in a very smooth link between beach number one, Miami Beach, and beach number two, I'd like to discuss the final piece in the program. Um, Gustav Holst, the perfect fool English composer. Amateur trombone player. As Michael said, um, aren't you all? <laughs> well, certainly for the last 18 months, we well, have all been amateur trombone players, haven't we? It's interesting. What ties together this Holst piece and the Elgar piece that I'm about to talk about is, you know, the originality or lack thereof. Um, if you listen to The Perfect Fool, there's some stuff that's uniquely Gustav Holst about it, but a lot of it is Debussy. When you look at, you know, you, you listen particularly to the, the quiet midsection, there's a lot of Debussy in that. Um, heavily influenced uh, I would say he's not original apart from the second part of that slow section when it goes onto the piccolo and the harp and celeste and you hear that it is A original and B that every single film composer from that point on, 
from the history of films should be making regular payments to the Holst family. <laughs> because it's in almost every spooky moment of every spooky film you've ever heard. And you've got to remember, written in 1918 to 1922, the film, the movie hadn't been invented at that point. And yet there it is, purely in there. You know, it's it's simply film music. Um, and yeah, you know, people help, film composers help themselves to this sort of stuff. It's like the film composers who thought that um, Eric Kongold had uh, disappeared forever. So no one had noticed if they lifted a few bits of it. <laughs> Uh, and then he came back largely through the efforts I think of Andre Previn really pushed Eric Kongold really started playing his, his music again so that leads us to beach number two um, I flew back from Miami and hit the ground running did a class at Wells Cathedral School by distance which was wonderful to hear not only the standard but their love of music still there just like it always was um then did my teaching with my amazing new class this year amazing new class and then i judged the swiss open brass band championship and um which was quite interesting to return to my a big part of my uh, uh, dna um, for those of you who don't know the process it's kind of like covered in seat you got to keep separate from the bands and you're behind a curtain and you don't know who's playing and you know you're not allowed to leave the judge's room in case someone tries to offer you a bribe or or kill you or something <laughs> that was an intense day intense day really intense but i can tell you now the quality of swiss brass bands is absolutely extraordinary speaking of extraordinary that's something i'm going to talk about later too um the word extraordinary so then it was off to liguria for our annual holiday we don't go on holiday in in the summer because this is where the world likes to come on holiday we live in a kind of like a holiday resort here in the alps and we have a nice pool in the garden so we stay at home with the kids it's great but there's this thing called the herbstferien the autumn the fall holiday that all of the kids get three weeks off so they go back to school in the middle of august and then get three weeks now seems a bit weird but we love it we go we go down to liguria beautiful liguria five hours drive from where we are straight down lovely drive um and uh crystal blue waters lovely beaches medieval fishing villages it was fantastic anyway that, 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 not trying to make you feel jealous it was a great holiday i have to say it was a great holiday and uh, my blood pressure did uh, drop considerably within half an hour of arriving <laughs> anyway where we stayed was a place called la guelia which is two kilometers away from where elgar composed in the south alasio alasio which um sadly i think back then was probably a much more nicer, glamorous, quiet place than it is now. Where we were, La Guelia is beautiful. Alasio, mm, not so. Anyway, um, Elgar wintered there, I think, in uh, 1903, something like that. And uh, he was inspired to write the piece in the south, Alasio. And um, even, I'm just reading from Wikipedia here. In a flash, it all came to me. The conflict of the armies on that very spot long ago, where I now stood, which is a neighbouring town of uh, Andorra, the contrast of the ruin and the shepherd, and then all of a sudden I came back to reality. In that time I had composed the overture, the rest was merely writing it down. In a flash it came to me, the conflict of the armies that stood on that spot where... I did the last one, last podcast I did was spirituality in the practice room. This is obviously spirituality in the uh, in the composer's studio, the visitation that Elgar had. Um, this sort of a premonition, this sort of like weird feeling. Premonition is the wrong word, you know what I mean? This sort of like dramatic feeling that on this spot something devastating happened. Now, I'd like you to take a listen to um, In the South. I just 
because we were there, I thought, oh, we had a lovely view of the sea, open the windows and put in the south on on, 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 on the uh, speakers. And the first one that came up was a recording of the piece by the Philadelphia Orchestra and Ricardo Muti. Now, I assume Ricardo Muti decided to play that piece because he was an English composer, but hey, he was composed in Italy. It's about... Italy, I'm Italian, I'm going to do it. And magnificent it is. What a great recording. Not sure when it was, but you can find that on, on YouTube. Now, the reason why I find I found this an interesting topic of discussion, we all know land of hope and glory, salut d'amour, all of these salon type pieces, enigma variations. Well, enigma variations where you get the odd dark cloud or the rumbling of your ship's engine or whatever, you know. But it's all kind of like Elga, Elga, Elga. It's all that, that, that style, uh, like in the, uh, in the first symphony. Uh, by the way, did you know I did the first performance of Elga's first symphony and the first performance of his cello concerto? <clears throat> in Vienna um, <laughs> they hadn't played it at least nobody on the stage had played it and they didn't know it either and I remember we did Elgar's first symphony and one of the violinists came up to me and said hey what's this bad Brahms <laughs> so the um, connection shall we say to a lot of Germanic composers in Elga is very clear I don't think it's totally original the greatest English composer in my opinion is um, Benjamin Britten uh, before the summer I had the great honor of preparing the Gustav Mahler Youth Orchestra on the War Requiem what a work of, pr of protest that is wow that is truly a great, great, great work. Look into it, study it. It's on the level of the Verdi Requiem without question. Um, the issues, the issues that are, arise in that work that he wove into there, the activism that he ro wove into there I, is a podcast in itself and I'm not smart, not remotely smart enough to do that. Going back to Elgar, going back to uh, Alasio, uh, I think if you look, when you listen to this piece, if you look at the Till Eulenspiegel, was written in 1895, also Sprach 96, Helden Leiden 98, you can see when you listen to this piece that Elgar was somewhat heavily influenced by Richard Strauss. Um, there are some <laughs> chord progressions that are just pure um, Strauss. Um, but... Going back to that visitation that he had, that there are some seriously out of character moments of Elgar. Well, I must say in this recording of, of Ricardo Muti, you know, Ricardo quite also uncharacteristically uh, let loose the dogs of war, shall I say, upon the performance. Um, he's known for being uh, quite uh, careful with his balance and in some orchestras very careful with the brass balance. Not in that case, let me tell you. Uh, they were very clearly let off the, the leash. And I'm not sure who was playing bass trombone on that uh, recording, but I, I can only say that if, if I, I don't think Arnold Schwarzenegger plays the bass trombone, but if he did, it would sound like that. Um, it's, actually, it's live and it's very, very good. It's a difficult piece to pull off. But you'll hear almost within the first three or four minutes this out-of-character visitation that Elgar has um, and so I just wanted to to bring that to you to hear it's like it's like the you know the family Labrador that's the perfect house pet and all of a sudden bites someone in a pub <laughs> it's totally out of character but it is a great piece and it's a great great uh, performance while we're on the subject of, of Ricardo Muti, you can hear actually hear this piece of paper. I've actually done some preparation for this. Um, have a look at Instagram. Um, that's if they've got the thing back up and running again. <laughs> um, Ricardo Muti performed again with the Chicago Symphony. Go to the Chicago Symphony um, Instagram site and look at the speech. Listen to the speech that of the maestro made to the audience 
it's one of the greatest documents of our time, in my opinion. And he talks, obviously, about the tragedy of the pandemic and the tragedy of so many deaths and the tragedy that has happened to society. And there's one quote that I'd just like to bring to you. If you kill the economy, it affects us physically. If you kill culture, it affects our soul. I have to say, through all of this, I think his comments have been balanced, reasonable, and of all of the people in the musical sphere, has been the one who has really stood up and gave his opinion. So I take my, I salute him yet again. Um, so there you go. Some interesting ramblings about the story of two beaches. Wonderful Miami Beach and beautiful La Guelia in Liguria. Actually, I shouldn't say that too loud because we want to book the same place next year. Uh, it's, it's not that great. Just leave it to me. It's a matter of taste. And we say goodbye to Bernard Heitink, who has closed his eyes for the last time at the age of 92. I think for many of us of my generation, we first got to know Bernard on what we call Boxing Day in the UK on the 26th of December. There was a big tradition on BBC Two television to have a live performance of a Mahler symphony. Every year he went through one, next year was two, next year was three, and so on. And um, this became an institution, an enormous tradition for so many of us, wonderful performances. Now, I'm told that Bernard was nervous as heck when he did that. He didn't look it. And his efficient conducting technique where he would just gently raise his shaking hand down and Armageddon would erupt from the orchestra. You know, was, they were remarkable performances from um, a remarkable man and a remarkable musician. Around that time, he was also a music director at Covent Garden. I guess he would have been the the salve easing the situation after the tumultuous years, yet very successful years with Sir George Schulte. <laughs> I think Bernard was the perfect antidote. He was one of these, a very rare creature indeed, who was a great conductor, managed to get great results, was universally loved and did all of this by being a nice guy. He was, a, basically from what I could see, a very shy person and was troubled, I think, with self-doubt. But I think that's a great testament to the man. Most people who are intelligent, highly intelligent, doubt what they do and question what they do. Only fools don't, but they become politicians. <laughs> um, I saw him do one of the most amazing rehearsal blocks I ever saw. I always say the best rehearsal I ever saw in my life was Nielsen Four with Simon Rattle in the Vienna Philharmonic. He took it apart and put it back together like a, like a Swiss watchmaker. It was incredible and explained the piece to the orchestra. But I saw Bernard do um, Bruckner Eight in Vienna. I saw, I played, I took part in. I played with him in London and I played with him in Vienna. And he was a man of very few words and incredibly encouraging eyes. Speaking of which, I remember doing Berg three pieces with him. Those of you who don't know it, it doesn't start very pleasantly for the first trombone. Ha have, a, uh, have a listen. Um, and he said nothing to me at all. He just rehearsed the beginning several times, kept going there and it was, it was a, it's a scary moment. I don't mind admitting it's a scary moment. I never missed Berg three pieces, by the way, not even in a rehearsal, but I always thought I was going to. <laughs> and I remember quite clearly doing it in Carnegie Hall. And as I took a breath, this look of not obvious encouragement, but this look of empathy, this look of care, this look of, of, of a deeper kind of encouragement was extraordinary. Um, 
but going back to the Bruckner, Bruckner 8, is the Vienna Philharmonic with Bruckner 8. To all intents and purposes, Ronald McDonald could conduct Bruckner 8 with the Vienna Philharmonic. It's a bit sort of like press play and uh, watch it happen. They know what they're doing. And he said, I think literally nothing. <laughs> but he played the piece through, I think, three or four times. And maybe exaggerating if I say four. Um, but over two or three days, he played it at least three times. He said, go to the end of the first movement. That's a ping on my, um, on my um, WhatsApp, which shows the dangers of modern life. Um, and, you know, he, uh, he did the piece, like I say, three times over three days. And he got to the end of the first movement and he said, shall we do the second movement? And he said, got to the end of the second movement. Shall we do the third movement? Shall we continue? I think you know this. And I watched him because I'm a fan of conductors and a bit of a, an amateur conductor myself, as we all are. And um, actually, that's not true. Sometimes people do pay me for it. Um, <laughs> and he almost conducted a different part of the orchestra at different points in every phrase on each one of the run-throughs. And with his gestures and with his hands, with his face, he was instructing different segments of the orchestra what he wanted to do in that phrase, in that part of the structure, at that time. And I don't know how many other people noticed him doing that, but I thought he was absolutely brilliant. Um, and the performances were extraordinary. In one of the last conversations I had with him, I tried to, you know, as very often, it's a bit like, asking Maurice Murphy about how he did things. He didn't really understand it. And I'd seen with Bernard, as I've seen in, you know, in an extreme case with Claudio Abbado, and to an extent with Simon Rattle, is they put their hand down and it sounds like Beethoven. And then they seem to put the hand down exactly the same way again. It sounds like Haydn. And it's extraordinary. I went to coach at the, the uh, Pacific Music Festival. I did the first one of those, by the way, in 1990 with Leonard Bernstein. Um, and I went to coach, I don't know, 2006, 2007, Marla 9, I believe it was. And there was an assistant conductor doing a very fine job. Excellent. At the beginning of Marla 9, you know, the, the fourth horn comes in, a pew, boom, boom, button, the harp plays. But with no disrespect to anyone, they sounded like a youth orchestra and it sounded like it needed instruction. And Bernard came in, I think fresh from an aeroplane, and put his hand down and all of a sudden Marla entered the room. <laughs> all of a sudden we were in Marla's sound world instantly. And that always stuck with me, always fascinated me. And um, I, one of the last conversations I had with him, I asked him about that. I said, Bernard, when you put your hand down, it sounds like Beethoven. Then we do Marlowe, you put your hand out. How do you do this? And he said, Klangvorstellung, imagination of sound. And I thought, okay, that's it. You don't understand this. It's something that's come from somewhere else. It's something otherworldly. Like I say, the, you know, something coming from whatever or whoever put us on this planet, something special that just he could transmit through his body to an orchestra um, that was very, very special. He was already sadly missed by us all because he retired a couple of years ago. But he will be universally remembered with great fondness. Um, in the end, all that remains are human qualities, and his were immense. He was a beautiful human being. Goodbye, Bernard. So there we have a slightly shorter podcast than usual. I'm told I waffle on too much sometimes anyway. So there we go. hope you found that interesting. Um, really uh, great news. I um, did an interview or had a chat with my friend and former colleague in the Vienna Philharmonic, Jeremy Wilson. And we discussed everything from his life to views on pedagogy, uh, music, and even the future of the trombone as a solo instrument. And also we had a lot of fun as well doing it. It's a one hour, 50 minute interview coming your way soon. 
So there you go. I hope you enjoyed that. If there are any issues that you found particularly interesting, don't forget to contact me and always go to uh, ianbowsfield.com for lots more interesting stuff. Thank you.